Good morning. I call to order the September 15th, 2020 meeting of the Saline County Board of Commissioners. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Shadwick? Here. Commissioner Sparks? Here. Commissioner Vidrickson? Here. Commissioner Here. Weiss? Here. Commissioner White? I ask you to please stand and join me in a flag salute, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now move to the uh, citizens' input portion of our meeting where citizens may speak on county government, usually limited to three minutes, and items that are not on today's agenda. Does anyone wish to speak? Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the commission, and we will move on to the uh, approval of uh, the consent agenda, which consists of approval of prior minutes, approval of tax rule adjustments, approval of accounts payable and payroll, and approval of public forum agenda. Are there any commissioners who wish to amend, agen uh, remove, or anything from the agenda? No, sir. No. Seeing none, that, then I will, uh, the consent agenda will stand as approved. We'll move to action items. Uh, item number one. RFA 208-20, K-Work Trustee at Large nomination with Marilyn Lemer, Human Resources Director. Good morning, Marilyn. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, K-Work, which is our workers' compensation pool, has uh, is accepting nominations for an at-large trustee for the K-Work board. Pursuant their bylaws, it must be an elected official. I did ask several elected officials to see if they were interested, and Jamie has expressed interest. Jamie Doss, county clerk, has expressed interest in being nominated and selected. If selected, she would serve a two-year term. Alternatives are to nominate uh, Jamie Doss, County Clerk, for the vacant trustee at large position or take no action. Recommendation is to um, uh, nominate Jamie for that position. Are there any comments or questions uh, or other nominations from commissioners? If not, uh, I would take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we nominate Jamie Doss, County Clerk, for the vacant trustee at large position on the board. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 208-20 uh, K Work Trustee at Large nomination. Any further discussion? All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 4 0. Now, item number two. RFA 209-20, AFLAC Group Plan Options with Marilyn Lemer, Human Resources Director. Good morning again, Marilyn. Good morning again. AFLAC does our voluntary supplemental insurances for our employees. Uh, currently, they do offer several individual policies. Uh, they are going to offer some group policies for the same types of plans that they currently offer to our employees. It doesn't eliminate, um, it doesn't exactly mirror the individual policies or those coverages, but it does provide a group discount uh, that we can get as a, as a larger group. These plans are paid 100% by the employee. The county does not pay any portion of those premiums. The alternatives for action is to sign the agreement or do not sign the agreement. Recommendation is to sign it. There would be no budget impact. Uh, this would just offer a little bit of flexibility for employees if they want a different type of plan. I, I like the idea of having other alternatives uh, to our plan and, and let the, uh, the employee make up their own minds on what they think that they need. So uh, I will take comments from the other commissioners. Are there any, is there any public comment on this RFA? Seeing that, I'll bring it back to the commission for action. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve by signature the AFLAC group plan options agreement. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 209-20 AFLAC group plan options. Further comments? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 4-0. We will move to item number three. RFA 211-20 KSGov.jobs subscription with Marilyn Lemer, Human Resources Director. Marilyn, it's your show. All right. Uh, KansasGovJobs.com uh, gov is a public sector job posting site. They also do some applicant tracking there. We already have an applicant tracking uh, company that we work through. However, this would just give an extra place for us, for us to post our jobs to get a little bit more exposure and hopefully 
increase our applicant pools. Uh, currently there are 23 partner cities and counties that are using the site. I'm sure it will grow. Um, my hope is that maybe if somebody is out there looking for a job at one of our neighboring counties, they also see our vacancies um, and decide maybe it's a short drive and, and they might apply for our positions as well. So the alternatives are to um, authorize signature of the agreement or do not. Um, recommendation is to authorize signature of the agreement. There is a uh, annual subscription fee of $600. 50% um, of that is going to be paid from the Sheriff's Office budget. 25% from vehicle registration budget and 25% from human resources. Those other two departments uh, were willing to help us out in funding this. Uh, many of their positions, uh, they have many vacancies in those departments, so they offered to help pay for part of the subscription. Sounds like a reasonable request for me, from me. So, any other comments from commissioners? Public comment? Back to the Commission for Action. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve by signature the High Touch Inc. agreement as presented by staff. Second the motion. Been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 211 20, Kansas Gov. Jobs uh, description, uh, subscription. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 4 to 0. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Item number 4. RFA 210-20, Sheltering Memorandum of Understanding Agreements with Michelle Barkley, Emergency Management Director. All right. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Um, I'm here to request that the county enter into a um, MOU with both Webster Conference Center and First Covenant Church to serve as emergency sheltering sites. Um, emergency shelter is a temporarily, uh, temporary place of living um, that with our uh, location would be serving the county and the region potentially if needed. Um, this is to serve displaced families that um, may have lost their home in a disaster or those that are restricted to the basic needs like running water or electricity. Um, we have looked at both facilities and they both provide a unique opportunity um, placement wise and facility setup. So we feel that both options best serve the community no matter what situation is to take place. Um, your alternative actions are to approve the sheltering agreements with both Webster and First Covenant Church or uh, to not approve the agreements, but staff recommends that we enter into the sheltering agreements with those two facilities. Okay, uh, both facilities uh, are, are first class as far as I'm concerned in Salina and, and the fact that they are willing to partner and share their, their uh, facilities with us and, and jump in there and then no cost to the county. Uh, I don't see how we can turn it down. So, uh, other comments from commissioners? A, a quick question, Michelle. Do we have any other uh, locations that are under agreement right now? No, as of right now, it's just um, nothing formal. Uh, this is something that I wanted in place just in case something were to happen um, that we could fall back on having this assurance that there was a written agreement between these locations in the county. Okay, thank you. And you're right, something could happen at some point in time. You just, you, you never know what's going to, what the world's going to hand us. So, um, any public comment? Uh, bring it back to the Commission for Action. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve by signature the emergency sheltering agreement with Webster Conference Center and the First Covenant Church. Second the motion. It's been moved and second that we approve RFA 210-20 sheltering memorandum of understanding agreements with both the uh, First Covenant Church and Webster Conference Center. Is there further comments? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries 4-0. We will move to item number five. Resolution 20-2305, declaration of a state of local public health emergency for Saline County with Michelle Barkley, Emergency Management Director. Good morning again, Michelle. Good morning. Um, so like just uh, we stated that we, you never know what the world's going to throw at you. I am here to ask for an extension on the local public health disaster declaration that we have in place right now for COVID-19 for another 60 days. We still currently are receiving resource requests from the state and we are uh, providing sheltering for college students and um, community members at this time. Without this declaration, we are unable to um, have those resources or get reimbursed on the back end. So in other words, this, this uh, 
public health emergency uh, declaration or proclamation resolution allows us to for to apply for state resources and get those from the state. Correct. Any other public comment? Is there any comments from the commissioners? <coughs> I would like a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I move we adopt resolution 20-2305 as presented. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve uh, resolution 20-2305, declaration of state of local public health emergency for Saline County. Further comments? Not all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion carries 4-0. Mm -hmm. Item number six. RFA 212-20. <clears throat> Excuse me. Items to declare no value with Hannah Stambaugh, Deputy County Administrator. Good morning, Hannah. Good morning. Several of our Saline County departments have uh, lots of surplus items of inventory that are no longer needed, broken, not repairable, or have reached the end of their life. So this particular request for action is for the County Commission to declare the attached list of items that was in your packet as no value and authorize the sale of them on a government public auction on Purple Wave that is scheduled for October. Your alternatives are to declare the items as no value and authorize the sale of Purple Wave or don't declare and we will just keep them in storage. Obviously our recommendation is to declare the items of no value and um, authorize for us to sell them on Purple Wave. The list of items has been sent to all of the county departments first to make sure that anything that was on any of the list uh, either could or couldn't be used by any of the other departments and any proceeds from the sale of the surplus would just be deposited back into the general fund. How how has our uh, our luck, if you will, uh, been with the Purple Wave in selling items that are of no value? It's hit and miss. Um, we the reason that there's such a long list this time around was that this is a, about a year in the making. We had intended to do a Purple Wave auction in the spring and in the fall, but obviously COVID kind of hindered that ability last spring. Um, I don't have the exact numbers as to what we brought in the last one that we did, but um, sometimes it's a couple thousand dollars. It just kind of depends on, on what's what's in there. So lots of office equipment this time. I, I see a lot of items on here from senior services. I, I assume that's from the remodel uh, that we had over there. It's outdated, uh, all sorts of outdated equipment and, and uh, chairs and so forth. So. Yeah, staff did a fantastic job with uh, cleaning up everything um, and going through uh, things at, out there. At what point in time do we declare the no value items that haven't sold on paper uh, Purple Wave uh, for for someone to we can donate to the to the uh, Salvation Army or whoever? Is there, does that come to a point like that? We can do that. Um, obviously, the first step is obviously for you to declare the items of no value. We'll put it on Purple Wave. If it doesn't sell on Purple Wave, then we can also look at the, the donation of the items. There are some of the items on here that um, I don't know if it was on this list. Uh, there was one particular item that obviously there's, it can't be sold on Purple Wave. And so the request for that one would be for that item to be taken for scrap metal and, and whatnot. But I mean, I, I see some items that are probably going to the, uh, the landfill, some items that will probably sell, and some items that won't sell but are of value to uh, someone in need. So mm -hmm. right, uh, further questions from commissioners? Public comment. Bring it back to the commission for action. Mr. Chairman, I move we declare the items of no value and authorize the sale of surplus items on Purple Wave and dispose of non-repairable items as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 212-20, items to declare no value. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 And uh, post same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Item number seven. RFA 213-20, Emergency Radio Communication Project Costs with Hannah Stambaugh, Deputy County Administrator. Morning, Hannah. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, first off, I'm really excited to be at this point. Um, as you know, this particular project has been one that has been in the making for quite a while. Uh, last week on September 8th, the Board of County Commissioners had authorized Sling County to start entering into contract negotiations with Motorola for a new emergency radio communication system. 
Um, staff has worked pretty hard with the city of Salina as well as uh, finance uh, folks, our financial advisor and bond council to help look at the proper allocation of costs um, and then also explore different financing opportunities for this particular project. Um, our county administrator, Philip Smith Haynes, has gotten over several different financing options that was included in this RFA as a, a memo. Um, and he'll go through and explain that kind of stuff. So my job here today is to kind of explain to you the different cost breakdowns and how we derived at that and answer any questions on that side of it. And then we will also go over the different financing mechanisms that we have researched and, and looked into too as, as options. So when we, when we went through when we got the final cost breakdown from Motorola, we sat down with staff um, from both the city and the county and really looked at the detailed breakdown of it. Fully well knowing that when we went out for this request for proposals, that the proposal that came back was an all-inclusive thing for both the city, the county, the rural fire districts, and some other different uh, ent entities uh, with fire protection and the city of Osari and Gypsum. So, we went through and looked at infrastructure cost, the subscriber radios or the individual radios um, for people, as well as the maintenance costs and the other subscri subscription costs. When we went through the cost breakdown, we assumed the responsibility of the infrastructure to be an interest of the county purchasing that. And the reason being of the fact that the infrastructure for the whole entire system is something that would benefit everybody in the county, regardless of what agency it is that you work with. And then that the city of Salina would take on any of the costs that was associated with the 911 dispatch center because the 911 dispatch center is operated through the city of Salina. Now the county does have an agreement that uh, we do utilize the city of Salina for their dispatch services. They dispatch for the sheriff's office and rural fire and we paid for, for that service. The 911 dispatch center also is able to collect taxes, a 911 tax on phone bills and cell phone bills that they get from all of our county residents. So we figured the, the most equitable and I don't want to say easiest, but the most equitable division of costs would be for the county to take over the infrastructure and the backbone equipment and then the city to take over the costs for anything associated with, with the 911 dispatch center as well as their own subscriber radios for the fire department and police department and then break out also the costs associated with all of the rural fire districts and their radios. So what we came up with was the county infrastructure and subscriber radios for the sheriff's office, emergency management, and the health department to be a total of 7,047,943.46. And for the city of Salina, their total for infrastructure for the dispatch center, their subscriber radios, is two million three hundred and eighty-eight thousand four ninety and eighty-four cents, and then the total for the radios associated with the rural fire districts of nine hundred and sixty-two thousand four hundred and eleven and sixteen cents. The maintenance costs were a little bit more challenging to break out, but we were able to accomplish that. Uh, Motorola's contract or contract negotiations allows for maintenance years one, two, and three to be completely taken care of as far as the cost is concerned. And so maintenance wouldn't start up until year four. At that point in time, years four through 15, total cost allocated for the infrastructure on the county's portion be $1,828,457.11. And on the city's, the maintenance for the 911 dispatch center is $1,118,762.96. We also have third party maintenance. Um, and the third party maintenance is for those pieces of equipment that are not Motorola owned. So the microwave dishes, the logging recorder for the 911 dispatch center, and a couple of other things. And those costs were broke down appropriately as well. Infrastructure for the backbone equipment and then the equipment for the 911 dispatch center. There's also some subscription costs. There is a, um, uh, 
cell phone application that allows basically a push to talk type of application on a mobile device called Wave. And that has a subscription cost. We did put it right now in the county's bucket of $385,163. I do want to preface <coughs> that this is a particular subscription that can be utilized by different entities. So for contract purposes, it is on the county side, but fully well knowing this is a particular yearly cost that would be divided up into different or two different entities depending on their level of interest in, in having this particular subscription. Then we also have the asset management, and that was equally divided between both the city and the county. We both felt that that was a, a huge benefit to both entities and to share that particular cost. With Motorola's uh, negotiation and their, their potential contract, they have offered quite a few discounts and incentives. And we sat down from the staff level and really looked at how much was the county taking on and how much was the city taking on, how much of the discounts were specifically for the backbone infrastructure equipment that the county was interested or that the county um, had broke out and how much was associated directly with the 911 dispatch equipment and looked at those different percentages and applied them appropriately and just really appropriately, equitably and fairly as possible. There was also discounts associated with the subscriber radios and again, felt it very appropriate to uh, take those particular discounts and based on the number of subscriber radios that were being purchased by whatever entity to apply those discounts fairly. So. Um, how we have it currently is a potential uh, breakdown of costs for a contract of 15 years with Motorola with the county's share being $10,962,757.10 and the city of Salina $3,818,150.33. Obviously, you know, there's there's lots of different ways that we could have looked at breaking down costs. This was something that staff believed was the easiest and fairest way of being able to divide out those costs appropriately. And again, as I said, we really looked at and used a fine tooth comb to go through and ensure that the discounts that were provided by Motorola were divided out equally. So we do have the intention of bringing a final contract with Motorola for approval by the County Commission on next Tuesday, September 22nd. So this particular request for action is to provide you with what it was that we came to up with as far as the calculated breakdown of costs. Um, answer any questions that you have, but ultimately getting a reaffirmation that what we have divided out is what the county commission deems is appropriate. And then also request that the county commission um, or the, the county commission authorize us to expend uh, capital improvement dollars for the required 10% contract signing costs that would be coming up um, at contract signing appropriately next Tuesday. <laughs> Um, so with that, there's also another large portion to this request for action, and that is the financing piece of it. But before we go into that, I want to ask if you guys have any questions appropriately about the cost breakdown. Uh, well, and perhaps I can't see the forest for the trees here, but uh, w when I look at the, the city side of it uh, as using nearly three times as many radios as we have, and yet uh, the maintenance uh, and so forth is pretty much on us. They've got 1.4 million and we've got over $3 million in that. But how, how does that, oh, I mean, what's the equalization there? Or how did that, how did that come about? Okay, so the maintenance piece of it is not on the subscriber radios, not on the radios that the officers and everybody's carrying on their hips. The maintenance piece of it is on the backbone infrastructure equipment, so the towers, the microwave links, the fiber, all of the software that is associated to keep the system up and running. The subscriber radios have their own maintenance warranty piece and that is covered for five years. After that, really the life of an individual radio is about anywhere from seven to 
eight years, depending. So there's there's some cost in here associated with you know fine tuning the subscriber radios. But for the most of it, this is the maintenance on the backbone infrastructure making the whole entire system work. But if the towers aren't there and towers don't have the maintenance, their radios aren't going to work anyway. Is that correct? I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting in the way here, I, I'm, I'm sure. But, uh, uh, and I know that the county is going to have more cost involved than the city. I know that. But I'm just, I'm just having trouble here. Uh, with, with the level of <coughs> three three million versus one point four million, so I've asked my question. Um, other commissioners, I, I want. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Roger. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, a quick question here: uh, the maintenance on the the Motorola only uh, has nothing to do with the radios. You you answered that, but if we if we're looking at this and you've got all this priced out over a, for a fifteen year program but you're telling me that the radio is only a good seven to eight years why aren't we going ahead in pricing in this I mean do you want to just at the end of seven years that when we start, need to start doing another two million dollars of, of radios or three million dollars radios we have to come back and look at adding that back into here not necessarily back into here. So this is what I will tell you. The, the, the first initial purchase of all of the, because we're going to a brand new system. We are on a UHF system now, right. so we, we need brand new radios to, to move to an 800 system. Even today, every single one of our agencies budget for brand new radios regardless. So that is a budgetary item that each of our individual departments, the rural fire districts, city, county, that's something that we're going to have to take into, a, take into account, say, year seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, an individual radio itself, it, I mean, it can last seven years, it can last 10 years, it just really kind of depends. Um, the biggest thing is, is making sure that the that backbone infrastructure is properly functioning, and that's where all of that maintenance cost is at, is making sure that all of that stuff stays up to date, that all the software is updated appropriately, any bug fixes are there, anything associated with the towers to make sure that the system is up and functional so that those individual radios can work. Okay. And the, and, excuse me, Jim, but the, the wave subscription, could you go through that one more time? Sure. So the wave subscription is basically an, an app that you would put on a cell phone and basically would make your cell phone device a push to talk radio. Okay. So it certainly does offer a very cost-effective way of being able to put communications features in the hands of, say, the possibility of the schools or even some of the rural fire districts that may not be able to purchase all of the radios at one time, um, the animal shelter, whatever the case might be. Um, the reason <laughs> this was not something that we um, had really thought about first, um, but certainly could see a huge benefit with this because the cost of an individual radio mm -hmm. is several grand versus the cost of putting an app on your cell phone being um, a little bit of a lower cost and that being maybe a little bit more attractive to some of those entities that don't really need a, a public safety grade radio. The reason that we, it's a subscription, so it would be a yearly cost. So this $385,000 is the cost over 15 years. Is this unlimited? It is limited to 200 licenses. Okay. Okay. But we also have to remember that's 200 at one time. Um, so again, that certainly gives us an, an opportunity to kind of look at where those costs could possibly be split up. So let's say, and um, we get in touch with the schools and the schools say, absolutely, this would be a great thing for our teachers to have or for our security staff, whatever the, that case might be. Well, what we would look at doing was, well, how, how many licenses does a school want? If the school wants 100 licenses, then we would take that yearly subscription cost and break that out 50-50, obviously. Um, so 
we know that there's going to be a further breakdown and not all of this 385000 is going to be a yearly cost on the county's part. Um, it's just we haven't had those conversations with those different entities yet to really figure out the true breakdown. The other thing that is probably to be kept in mind is that uh, the maintenance agreements and the subscription services will not go into effect until final system acceptance. So the whole radio system has to be built out first. We have to sign the agreement saying we accept it. So we're not looking until probably February-ish of 2022 before these yearly maintenance costs and subscription costs are going to come into play. But they are a part of the overall contract price. Okay. Uh, a couple questions, and you might have already answered one, but I might have you expand on that. But looking at the subscriber radio costs, uh, the bulk of the counties would probably be SO, I would assume. Yes. And emergency management. Um, the, the bulk of them are, are definitely the sheriff's office. Um, he, the, he's um, done a really good job in the past. He's already started to purchase some of those tri-band radios for his patrol division, but a bulk of this is all for corrections. Okay, that, that answer, Mike, because I, I was aware that he had started the 800 megahertz mm -hmm. purchases, and but there's a lot more out there that needs to be done. There is. Okay, going back to your... Um, um, and, and along that line, the, the rule of fire, um, every, every district probably has a different budget and uh, some will be able to absorb this. They've planned for it. There might be some out there that, that aren't, aren't able to attain this. Uh, when the system goes up and running, or, or they just, will they just limit the number of radios instead of every man carrying a radio? It might be every squad carrying a radio, or every truck company, or is, is that the plan? Well, I, I can't speak for each individual's district's plan. Um, what we did do is we divided out the cost because each rural fire district told us how many radios it was that they thought that they needed. And I think some of them, really in all honesty, shot on the low side, um, but they're trying to be a, a little bit conservative. Um, we have sent those cost estimations to each one of the rural fire districts, and the intention is, is to bring all the rural fire district chiefs together so we can look at that in a little bit more detail and talk about it, and talk about it from an operational standpoint. Um, and that was one of the thoughts that came about was, okay, maybe not every guy gets a radio. Um, maybe we assign two radios to each truck or depending on how that works, but that will be an operational decision at the district level. Okay, and and the, the wave subscription would also be something that they, that they could buy into and do it in a cheaper way than what they would a radio. Absolutely. Can the wave subscription be expanded from the 200? Yes. For it, more money, you can go 300, 400 mm -hmm. if, if the need's there in the, in, in the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, the Motorola representative that we talked to about WAVE, um, he had mentioned, he goes, I have a feeling that you'll probably go through your 200 licenses pretty quickly, and you'll probably need more. Right, there will um, probably be uh, maybe Salina Regional or some others that, that have a need. Uh, so, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, 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 I like that WAVE uh, subscription part of it, I think that really gives uh, gives some flexibility to some other entities as far as emergency communication. Absolutely. Hannah, I, I know that we're going to get more into the, uh, the how we're going to pay for it part of it here in just a second, but uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the budget will not be impacted until 2022? Um, so there are going to be some budget impacts um, for 2021, um, but as far as the payments for maintenance and the subscriptions, some of them won't occur until 2022 um, with the actual system maintenance because years one, two, and three are covered under the contract. That particular maintenance period won't start until that yearly maintenance cost won't start until 2026. And you said there is some cost in 2021? That is correct. And do we have that budgeted? 
So that's a perfect transition. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. So um, there's two things that the commission needs to consider today. One is whether you agree with staff's proposed breakdown of costs between Saline County, the city of Salina, and the rural fire districts. The second piece is obviously how do we pay for this? And so as uh, the commission's aware through the budget process, we have started putting money away. We put $600,000 in the capital improvement program for the current year, 2020, and also for 2021. And we based that number of $600,000 on an assumption that we would be lease purchasing the bulk of the system and figured that over about a 15 year period, based on what we knew about costs at the time, the annual payment would be in that, excuse me, in that $600,000 range. So, um, once we got the costs back from Motorola, the costs that you've seen today, we met with our bond counsel and financial advisor, both of whom are, are present here today as well, uh, to talk about some options. And the first thing that came up was, hmm, you know, a traditional lease purchase might not be the best option. And there are a couple reasons that that might be the case. One is because we are um, purchasing the system jointly with the city of Salina, a bank might have some conceptual difficulties with what their collateral would be on a lease purchase. And in order to protect themselves, they might jack up the interest rate a little bit. The second difficulty is that Motorola um, unlike some of the other vendors, uh, weights their costs very heavily on the side of services rather than physical goods. So their, um, their cost for a subscriber radio is X, but their cost for installing programming, etc., is basically um, about 50% of the total cost of um what we would be uh, contracting for. And so because services are so highly weighted in this uh, particular purchase, that also poses a potential um, mental difficulty, mental block for some of the banks who traditionally do lease purchase financing. So um, Dave Artiberry with Stiefel Nicholas uh, did talk to some banks and it is it's possible to do a traditional lease purchase uh, for this project, but again, might not get us the best interest rate. So uh, in, in consultation with Dave and um, Mitch from Gilmore and Bell, we started doing some brainstorming. We had uh, three different calls um, and uh, also spoke with the city about their plans and came up with a list of six different options and uh, have included in your packet today a memo outlining each of those six different options and a recommendation. And so there are a number of, of um, different possibilities for how we could finance the the purchase and in addition to the traditional lease purchase they include um, trying to utilize uh, geo bond financing for a portion of it unfortunately the way the laws in kansas are written uh, we couldn't avail ourselves of a geo bond for the uh, majority of the purchase because the majority of the purchase uh, for the towers and so forth is uh, land pertinent real estate uh, transaction and counties cannot under Kansas law do a geo financing for real estate without voter approval um, geo of course is the lowest interest rate but the sort of I guess second lowest interest rate would be to utilize what is called a public building commission and a public building commission is a separate municipal entity that is set up by a county or a city under a particular provisions of state law 
and it works essentially like a lease purchase with a bank, except that the entity that holds title to the uh, asset is not the bank, but is the public building commission. So the county would lease the equipment from the public building commission. The public building commission would then in turn issue bonds and raise uh, the, the capital. And because they are um, bonds, and because under state law, the uh, lease to a public building commission is not subject to annual appropriation under your cash basis law, like a traditional lease purchase with a bank is, those interest rates tend to be lower. So that is actually staff's recommendation, is that we pursue the um, formation of a public building commission and go that way, we think that will achieve the optimal interest rate for this particular purchase. Just mention a couple of the other um, items that were touched on in the memo. Um, we do have a, a number of plans for things that we are purchasing from our capital improvement plan, as you know. Um, we have uh, items for the senior center for road and bridge, and probably our biggest planned expenditure from capital improvement program is improvements at the expo center. And so we have quite a bit of cash in the capital improvement uh, program at the present time. One possibility would be um, to do a bit of a shell game and pay for the radio project using a lot of that cash and then um, potentially finance something like the expo improvements. Um, not recommending that option for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, we started to get concerned about the drawdown of cash in the capital improvement fund um, for a couple of different reasons. One being it forecloses future opportunities. So as new things come up, it's always nice to have some cash reserve that you're sitting on in case you uh, need to take advantage of a future opportunity. But secondly, um, also concerned about the overall picture that paints of the county's financial health. One of the great things um, that we have going for us in terms of a credit rating on bonds, such as the potential bonds for a jail project, is the fact that we do have a, a good deal of cash. In fact, um, more than 30% of our uh, annual budget um, that we have in cash reserves. And so that will be looked on very favorably by credit rating agencies in, in terms of bonds that we might issue, as I said, um, such as the jail. And so drawing that amount of cash down uh, could uh, affect our credit on other, uh, other projects. So, um, I'd be happy to answer questions about any of the options, but again, the recommendation from staff is to pursue formation of a public building commission uh, and utilize that, and um, as I said, both um, Mitch and Dave are here as well to help me answer questions that I might not be well, the first, most expert um, for. Do we need to act on part one of this? I mean, we've dove into, uh, we, we scurried right past part one and now we're into part two. Do we need to act on that part one first uh, uh, before we start asking questions on part two? Do we need to approve the part one first? So um, staff will be asking for you to approve, you know, both uh, parts of this. So there are two potential motions um, for the commission to consider this morning. I don't think it makes a particular difference what 
order if you want to have discussion, if you feel like discussion on part two would inform your vote on part one, or if you want to go ahead and act on part one uh, before we moved into part two, I think that would be acceptable as well. I'll, I'll ask my other commissioners, do you, do you want to just get, well, I guess we can wait and do the whole thing at once, or we can do the part one and authorize. I think we're going to be in favor, I mean, the way I'm hearing things, we're going to be in favor of part one. That's for certain that uh, the county's share of the costs associated with the project uh, and, and take care of that part of it. I think we're going to be in unison there, I think. Um, I have a couple questions. Well, in, in regards to that, that or? Correct. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that there will be expenditures in 2021 with the bulk being in 2022, but in reading this document, there's also expenditures in 2020 of 700,000? Yes, so as I mentioned earlier, we do have 600,000 set aside in the current year in uh, capital improvement uh, for this project. Um, we would need about 704,000, so about 104,000 more than we originally anticipated. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, there's plenty of cash in the capital improvement fund, so we would seek authorization from the commission to go ahead and expend 704,000 for this purpose from capital improvement in the current year. Okay, and, and no matter how we, how we act on part two, on part one, my question would be, uh, would uh, procuring uh, uh, bonds for the radio system impact the uh, jail bond issue if that comes up? No, it's, um, this is well, David, uh, uh, step there. <laughs> I, I, again, though, I, w I would like to get part one off the table before we start asking questions on part two. That, that is about part one. How are we going to fund part one is what my question is. And I thought he answered that with the 700000 and the capital improvements, or uh, am I mistaken? I'm, I'm very possibly mistaken. I, th I thought we were looking at doing part one with bonds, but... Uh, okay, so um, the first part of the discussion, the first item for the commission to consider is whether you agree with the breakdown between the county, the city, and the rural fire districts. I so am. that piece sort of is independent of, <coughs> of the second piece, which is how you pay for it. I guess what I would, what I would like to do is uh, go ahead and, and act on part one and get it off the table, and then everything will pertain to the financing portion of it. I'm ready for that also, um, so I will make a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we affirm the county's share of the cost associated with the project and authorize the expenditure of CIP funds to execute the contract. Second motion. Yeah, uh, all right, it's been moved and seconded that we approve part one, which is, uh, as, as the motion states, are there further discussion? A question, we're, we're uh, entering into a contract but it's just to be decided how we're going to pay for that. I, that might uh, change my my vote. If my my motion is that we affirm the county's share of the cost. We are not signing a contract. Y yeah, it just uh, I I think I could clarify that. Um, today we're just talking. Um, about a financing plan, and there are two pieces for the financing plan. One what is it that we're financing, and two, how is it that we're financing it. But this is not the actual contract. The actual contract would come back to you next Tuesday for action. Um, so this is just, this is a little bit theoretical this week, but we wanted you all to know the costs and, and the plan for dealing with those costs before you had an actual contract in front of you. So. I hope that helps. I guess that's where it leaves us, Jim and I, both in a, in a little bit of a quandary because we're 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 approving an RFA here for this, and yet you're saying that's not what we're really approving. I mean, that's I hear it, but I as our as our agenda is is uh, printed here. I mean, I I'm for getting part one off the table, but it doesn't mean anything, is what you're telling me. It doesn't necessarily mean that we've approved it. Well, it, it means that you approve that breakdown of costs. Um, once we bring a contract to you, we will bring you that 
a, a contract with that breakdown of costs. Okay. Because if you had, we would like to know today, <laughs> before we bring you a contract next week, if you want us to go back and renegotiate something different with the city, right? That's, that's okay. the, and, the and important I'm part that. for that. And then also we would like to know before we bring you a contract that you're comfortable with how we are proposing to pay for it as well. So that's now w once we get to that, that seven hundred thousand dollars that we were talking about paying would come off of the ten nine sixty two and take that bondable number down. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. And I, I'll all right. I'm, I'm gonna stop there. I still got another question here, but we're gonna. We're, we'll go from there. Uh, I see a question from our audience. Co please come to the uh, podium and state your name. And you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mitch Walter with Gilmore and Bell, Bond Council to the County. I just had one brief comment to the $700,000 that's uh, under discussion for the, the initial cash payment. Um, should the county choose to do so, no matter what sort of financial plan it adopts, it would have the option to adopt what we call a reimbursement resolution, where if it wanted to, it could get that money back with a financing later on down the road. And that's all my comments for this portion. Okay, and that, that, that's a, a logical piece of the puzzle there that we can address that. And do I want to borrow from my money market fund or how or do I want to do that? So, uh, so we do have a motion on the, uh, the table and a second to approve part one, which is affirm the county's share of the costs associated with the project and authorize the expenditures of CIP funds to execute the contract. Uh, based on the comment we just heard, do we need to exclude the CIP funds or does that still need to be in there? No, because we'll still need to expend them up front. Okay, okay. All right, are there further comments or questions? All of those in favor of the motion on the table, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries on part one, uh, f uh, four zero. Uh, m my comment, uh, based on what you've said so far, is I don't want to get into a bank of KDOT deal where we're, we've set aside money for one project, but we're going to take it and move it to another one. I, I don't want to do that. I mean, I want to keep funds moving and then not tell the Expo Center, well, we're not going to do that all of a sudden. Or the city, which we have a contract with the city to do those things. So I think we need to leave that money in place for certain. So um, I, I'm for keeping costs and expenditures and money for a project in that project's um, portal and keep it right there. That's, that's a agreed, and that's why that's not staff's recommendation. I just wanted you to have all the options so you're aware that that was an option. Not trying to hide the ball, but that is not staff's recommendation. Staff's recommendation is to move forward with formation of a public building commission, which would be for this project. Okay, also you said that there was six options. Is that, did I hear you right? Yes, correct. But, but our sheet only shows four, or is okay. there something? So in the memo, there are six options that are detailed, and then there are four that are summarized on that chart. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll be quiet for a minute and let, let you talk to us. Oh, okay. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm done with my questions. Okay, so do you want me to go through the six options? I'm, I'm open or? to whatever other okay. commissioners want to hear. It's fine by me. I believe you touched on... You've already went through those. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I didn't go through them one at a time, but I did summarize them. But I'll just r reiterate. So the, f the first option would be traditional lease purchase financing. The second option would be um, utilization of a public building commission. Um, the, the third option would be to try and um, finance a portion of it utilizing the GEO bond. Um, the fourth option would be to um, to uh, Sorry, I'm getting them. Private placement up. lease, maybe? Use of government um, obligation ones. Uh, 
Oh yeah, the, 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 sorry, the third option, the second option would be the Public Building Commission. The third option would actually be the, the lease back bonds. And so I can go into that a little bit in detail. The fourth option would actually be the use of the GO bonds for uh, the non-real estate portions. The fifth option um, would be to um, finance other improvements such as the Expo um, and then um, the the, f the final option would be to sort of, um, as I say in the memo, do a little from column A and a little from column B. So to use a portion of cash and then draw down the cost of a lease. Um, the one that I didn't touch on earlier is the, the lease back bonds or certificates of participation. And so um, that is also an option that is available. And would um, essentially work like a lease, but um, would involve a public sale rather than placing them with a particular bank. And because it would involve a public sale, could be expected to generate a slightly lower interest rate than a traditional lease. Um, lease purchase with a bank, but um, still would likely be a, a slightly higher rate than um, a public building commission because it would still be subject to the annual appropriation clause. Well, my apologies uh, for asking that question again, but that, that's, that's why when we move from part one to part two without ever acting on to part one, that's where I left the ball on the table. So I, I do appreciate and and remember all of the options that you were giving us in the first place. I just didn't associate it with part two as much as I have. So uh, other cup, uh, questions or comments? Do we need to hear from our council, bond council people or anything else? Uh, I think, yeah, I'll just say, say it. Go ahead. Uh, David Arterberry with Stiefel Nicholas. It's a pleasure to be here. I think um, Phil did an excellent job of um, putting together these different options, and I know there's a lot of them. Um, in, in Kansas, uh, counties um, are somewhat restricted in how they can finance large capital improvement projects or equipment acquisitions. So sometimes it's a matter of looking at um, sort of a, a whole bunch of different ways of doing things that might not be uh, all that straightforward. It's not, not as nice and neat and clean as just being able to issue general obligation bonds for the project. You have to drill down into these a um, little bit more esoteric options. And I think Phil did a really good job in his memo of, of laying those out. Okay. All right, thank you for those comments. Uh, so, if, if there are no further questions from commissioners, go ahead, Monty. I do. So, under all this, if we do the building commission, the building commission still has a lot of options on how to finance. I mean, we're not saying just one one way, right? If we do the building commission. Typically, a public building commission would issue bonds. That's how they um, raise their capital because they don't have taxing authority. Um, they are a separate entity, but they don't, um, what, well, like I said, they don't have taxing authority, so they issue bonds subject to a contract with, in this case, the county, where they would own title to the asset and lease it to the county, and their revenue stream for paying back the bonds that they've issued is our annual lease payment to them. The reason investors like that is because that lease obligation under state law is not subject to annual appropriation. And so that drives down the, uh, the interest rate on those PBC bonds. Do we know who would be on this building commission? No. So what we would have to do if we were pursuing this, if, if the commission agrees with staff's recommendation to pursue this option, we would have to come back with formation documents. And that would include the composition of the commission and um, 
an appointment of members to it. So it has it is done different ways in uh, different uh, jurisdictions around the state. There are some places where actually the Board of County Commissioners serves as the public building commission. You just, okay. uh, you know, adjourn as the commission and reconvene as the public building commission and, and do it that way. There are other places where um, they're public members that are appointed that's completely separate from the county commission. You take your expression of interest forms, you pick three or five financially savvy people in the community and they serve as your public building commission and it's totally divorced from uh, the county commission and then there are some places where it's a mix where there's some county commissioners on there and some public members uh, sort of like how we do our um, uh, building authority. So this building commission is only um, being put in place to finance our portion of it, the county's portion. Not The city is going to do their own thing, however they, they need to do it, and correct. rural fire would do their own thing too. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Um, <clears throat> so, in, and this sort of harkens back to an earlier question, I think, from Commissioner Weiss. Um, the rural fire districts have largely been putting away money for a couple of years so each of them have they might not have all the money they need but each of them have a substantial portion of the money that they need um the city of salina they um they're actually in the process of doing a bond refinancing right now. I think I believe it's going to close in October, and so they would roll their portion of this obligation into that. Okay. So this would just be strictly for the county's portion. And, and this all makes sense to me, is and I'm assuming this commission, it's a not for profit. I mean, the, there's no profit there. They're just they're just moving funds correctly. It, it's a municipal entity under state law. So yeah, there's no profit. I mean, there's literally um, no other source of revenue for them other than their bond proceeds, and then those are paid back by their lease with us. So. The good news about a public building commission, though, is that um, once it exists, <laughs> it, it, it can be used for other projects in the future. So um, this same type of a um, lease that we would do with public building commission on radio system today in the future, you could use that for building some other type of, of building if you needed it, or um, doing some other type of, of project that um, you know you didn't want to go out and, and do something like what we're doing with the jail. And would our legal counsel be part of this, or do we go to outside legal counsel to form this? Somebody who's probably done this many times. So it's typically or? bond counsel. Okay. And so one of my big questions when we had our conversations with bond <clears throat> counsel and financial advisor was the speed with which this could be done. Because, um, it, you know, in part one, it, it, Hannah talked about the time frame and um, hoping to uh, really enter into a lease by the, or uh, sorry, a, a contract with Motorola by the end of this month. And so um, certainly have the cash to, to do the first payment on that, but then when the, the second payment comes due, we'd need to have a vehicle in place, you know, a lease or something to to make those payments. And so um, we had a conversation about that, and they assured me that, yeah, within a, a three-month time frame, we could put all this together. On a, on a public building commission, um, is this something similar to other, other uh, uh, advisories that we have that we don't have to take their advice? I mean, we can... I mean, does the commission still has to approve it? Uh, do we have the the right to say no? We're not going to take that advice and move on. I mean, is it is it binding? Um, so I will say yes and no. Um, you so it it is formed, and then 
it enters into an agreement with the county for the project, right? Once it enters into that agreement, so, so you can, um, you can decide not to do that. You can decide not to enter into that agreement. E even if the entity is formed, you can decide, okay, we're, you know what, we're not gonna do it. We're gonna go back and do traditional lease financing and we, we're just, we're done with that. But once you enter into that lease agreement, then it is binding for the term of that agreement. Okay, I, I buy into that, but I don't want to be the one sitting up here making the final decision uh, and yet have someone else make the final decision for me. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to have that option that I can opt in or opt out, you know, of what we're talking about. If, if that, if I'm making myself clear there. Go y ahead. Yeah, I mean, so you, like I said, you can, uh, uh, you decide whether to enter into the lease, but once you enter into the lease, it is then binding for the term of that lease. You cannot do an annual appropriation okay. with the Public Building Commission like you did with a traditional lease purchase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, am I understanding your question to be in, in sort of a big picture control? over this public building commission that we're talking about the creation so how we would typically set up these the the documents and, and the creation of the public building commission is that the members of the public building commission whether they be members of the commission or some other members of the community serve at the pleasure of the county commission so in that sense if you have sort of different agendas then it's the agenda of the county commission who ultimately controls who sits on that public building commission that will um, win any sort of uh, um, disagreement between the two bodies? So, uh, you know, um, with the, the rules yeah. of majority. Okay, that's that's making it clear for me. But the thing that I'm trying to stay away from is say we appoint a building commission with no commissioners on it whatsoever, mm -hmm. and then five citizens uh, or bankers, uh, whatever it is, whoever they are. And then they make the decision, then we have to say, well, there it is, that's what we gotta do. And yet we're the ones yeah, in taking that the case, heat. As, as Phil said, uh, you would have the option to not sign the lease. And so when, when you don't sign the lease, there is no mechanism for the Public Building Commission to have any revenues from which to pay their bonds. And so they can't sell bonds without a lease being in place. So the, the county as a, as a body has to agree to enter into that financing arrangement with the PBC. <clears throat> so if, if just for the sake of the conversation, if four years down the road, the PBC identifies some project that they want to undertake and the county doesn't want to undertake it and the PBC wants to go issue bonds, they're not gonna have any revenue stream without that binding lease being in place with the county to issue them. So it, it would not be able to happen. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm clear then. I guess going back to, uh, did you have another specific question? Well, I gonna, yeah, I, I did. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, with this public building commission being set up, mm -hmm. uh, they, they actually are, are, are pretty. They're not. They're not real dynamic. It, once a decision's made, is they're just they're just a an entity, and, and it. That's for the next 15 years or whatever, it just takes place. That's correct. We, we have, a, we have a, a structure that's worked in the past where we will draw up bylaws for the PBC, um, and they typically will meet as often as necessary if there's a, a project or a, a transaction that, you know, a bond issue um, under consideration. Other than that, they would typically meet at their at their convenience, but you know, no less than once per year. But but the PBC exists to finance public projects on behalf of the county. It has no other real function other than that. Um, it can hold title to real property, or the county can hold title to real property and just execute a ground lease to to the PBC. So the the, the county remains the, the the true body in control of the transaction and the PBC typically exists just to um, uh, do the wishes of the county through the financing, and that's why, again, the PBC exists to issue the bonds to fund those projects. Okay, thank you. Quick question here while you're still there, is that what happens in 15 years? Is this 
uh, PBC, is it something that really, once you get this lease set up and it's there, does it automatically just keep refunding itself and it is there? Or do these this board meet every year and <coughs> do that? The, the PBC board? Yes. Yeah, so the PBC members typically serve at the pleasure of the county commission. Uh, our default has been each county commissioner, depending on the number of the PBC, which we, we uh, it has to be at least three, it can't be more than nine. Um, our recommendation would maybe be not nine. If you have a certain number of county commissioners, it, it sometimes makes sense to have that number of PBC members so each county commissioner can basically appoint a member of the PBC, whether it's the actual commission or, or another member. But by serving at the pleasure of the county commissioner, that sort of ensures <coughs> that there's always going to be um, a PBC in place because each county commissioner w would have a selection and w as the county commission turns over so the PBC would then turn over as well. Okay, if that's that what I was kind of do. Do they have well, to be? But I, let me take that one step further, Commissioner. So I think what you're asking, if I'm hearing you correctly, do they keep perpetuating projects to keep themselves in business? And and no, okay. once this financing is done, um, then they wouldn't do anything else other than, an, you know, sort of exist in name only until a new project comes about. Okay, because my concern was is that over a 15 year period, the commissioners are going to change and possibly those board members or those members are going to mm -hmm. change. So. It just happens, and, and that does happen time to time. Oh, if, okay. if you have a, if you have three members on the PBC, it's you know not regularly meeting because there are not, no current projects. Then there would just be new members that would be reappointed by the current county commission okay. if if a project were to surface okay. in the future. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back if I can, and I hope I'm not muddying up the water too much. But uh, on the infrastructure costs, the county has 6.5 million and the city has 1.1 million. Just like we have a city county building authority of which the county is 60% in control of the members and the city is 40%, is there supposed to be some agency on here overseeing this? Or is that what this? No, the proposal, um, and you'll, this, you'll see this next Tuesday, the proposal is actually a three-party agreement between the city, the county, and Motorola. So that, that would be the actual contract. And so each body would be separately responsible for their portion. So Motorola wouldn't come after us if the city didn't pay their bill. And, and if there is... Maintenance, okay, the maintenance is covered down here. So, okay, I'll let that, we'll get back on track here. Are there further questions or uh, comments from commissioners? I, I th nope. Then I think we need to move forward with either approval or disapproval of part two. Mr. Chairman, I move we direct staff to pursue the establishment of a public building commission to finance the remainder of the county share of the radio project. Second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that we approve RFA part two of RFA 213-20 emergency radio communications project costs. Are there any further questions or comments from commissioners? If not, all of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion, that motion, part two, also carries 4 0. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your coming and your participation. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks so much. We'll move to the informational items. Uh, item number one Human Resources Update with Marilyn Lemer, Human Resources Director. Morning, Marilyn. Again. Mike. I'm sorry. This reporting period is mid-July to mid-September. Uh, during this time, we have hired 13 individuals. Uh, six have either transferred or promoted to a different position. We have eight that are no longer employed. 
Uh, during this time, we also completed our open enrollment meetings for our uh, insurance. Uh, we held meetings on the 2nd of September. The open enrollment period still goes through the 25th. Uh, we did have a recording of those meetings that we sent out for employees that could not sit through it. And we did have uh, 10 panelists that sat on there from our different um, benefit providers. Uh, fraudulent unemployment claims are on the rise with the Kansas Department of Labor. Um, as of the time I wrote this, there were seven employees that were affected by this. Uh, as of today, now we are up to eight. Um, so we are diligently contacting the employee and letting them know so that they can take steps to help protect their ID. Uh, we'll continue to monitor and respond and process requests under leave uh, under the FFCRA, which is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, we also sat through a, a Title VI review by KDOT. Uh, that was myself and the county engineer. Uh, this is due to federal funding that is received. Uh, we do need to make some minor updates to that uh, plan and we will do that by the end of the year. They gave us plenty of time to do that due to COVID. Moving forward, uh, hopefully fill some positions. Currently we're at eight vacancies. Um, if we are able to get a couple over hires and corrections, that would be ideal as well. Uh, we'll continue to work through uh, our insurance renewal contracts. Uh, continue with in-service planning, continue to explore electronic onboarding solution, and then we do have another blood drive next month. Um, budget update, the health plan is running favorable at about 87% of expenses to funding ratio. Dental plan is running at approximately 84%. Uh, no claims have hit the stop loss deductible, however, we are close on a couple, but our plan year does end at the end of this month. Uh, HR budget is at about 62% and is in line with historical averages. That's all I have. All right. Anyone have any questions for Marilyn? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to item number two. County Administrator's update with Philip Smith Haynes, County Administrator. Good morning again, Commissioners. Uh, just a couple items that I wanted to update you on briefly. Um, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, we did receive a word from the state that our um, plan was approved. So we are trying to proceed with getting the money out into the community. We made our first payment uh, on Friday, about eight and a half percent of the total of 11 million that has gotten out so far. Um, Last night, I did issue a memo to all of our uh, agencies that applied for funding to talk about the process and anticipate having uh, the first account payable for your commission to approve next Tuesday. Also next Tuesday, hoping to bring you an RFA uh, for approval of all of the memoranda of agreement with all of those agencies. Um, we do have a meeting of the advisory committee this afternoon as well as a, a meeting with our regional representative. The uh, state office of recovery has divided the uh, state up into uh, regions and uh, given us somebody to contact for questions. So that's uh, hopefully going to be helpful moving forward. Second item is an update on uh, outreach regarding the jail project. Uh, we do have uh, flyers that have been printed and we're starting to distribute. I've put some of those in each of the commissioner's mailboxes. Hopefully you've gotten those. Uh, we, uh, the sheriff and I were out to Brookville last night to speak with their city council about the project. They had a lot of great questions for us and we'll be in New Cambria this evening. Uh, on Thursday, we'll be visiting with the uh, North Salina Community Development Group. I, uh, the, we have a number of these meetings lined up, so I'm going to um, just put those into the commission calendar so you all are aware of when and where they are and can attend if uh, you would like. And that is what I had this morning. I'd be happy to answer questions. Questions for anyone? Uh, one question, you talked about an update on the coronavirus relief fund. Are, do you know how the chamber is, uh, how they're going forward with theirs and what steps they're in and how it's working for the private sector? 
So they have sent us a uh, draft uh, plan. Um, they've had pretty extensive uh, internal conversations about how they plan to implement this. And so um, going to be reviewing that with the coronavirus advisory committee this afternoon, um, the, the chamber's plan, and then um, we'll s hopefully bring it to you next Tuesday for approval. Um, the chamber, because, because of the volume of um, what they're being asked to take on, they wanted some modifications to our standard MOU that everybody else signed just to sort of protect them. And so that's kind of been the what we've been going back and forth on a little bit. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'll move to item number three. Commissioners, uh, commissioners comments? Anyone have anything? I do not. No. And item number four. Announcements. Um, I again think we don't have anything. So we'll move to the study session, which is item number one. Livestock and Expo Center. And the floor is yours, Philip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, just wanted to have an opportunity to have some conversation with the commission and not asking for any action at this time, but just uh, some dialogue. Um, Rick Lamer, our convention and expo uh, director, li livestock and expo director, has um, announced uh, that he is going to be leaving us next spring, and so we will be needing to uh, replace him. And so um, wanted to get a sense from the commission if uh, there were particular changes to the job description that you were interested in, um, how you see the um, the process rolling out uh, in terms of um, you know commission involvement and selecting somebody. You want Meryl and I to handle that and bring you a name? Do you want to appoint a commissioner to be involved in the selection process? Those types of questions. Um, and just, you know, some general discussion about how you see that um, person potentially playing into uh, the future of the Expo Center, particularly over the next um, five years when we have the, the projects that we'll be uh, looking at. Um, one thought that I had and have discussed with Rick um, and just wanted to toss out on the table and get commissioner reactions to is the idea that um, perhaps we should utilize a, um, a dedicated project manager to try and um, herd these uh, projects along over the five-year period. Um, if, uh, you know, I think depending on who the new director is um, that gets selected, um, they may or may not have knowledge of, of what has gone on in the past, and they may or may not have capacity to to deal with um, some of the aspects of bidding out those things and, and keeping all that rolling at the same time they're trying to get events into, into the Expo Center. So, um, you know, that's certainly a, a process that we've used, like at the Senior Center, um, Rosie has a a person who's kind of been managing that and then similarly uh, on a much <laughs> much grander scale uh, we've certainly used that approach um, with the jail project as well so just get uh, commissioners thoughts on whether we want to pursue that same sort of thing for these projects or whether we need to concentrate on on hiring somebody who has that kind of capacity so um, well, you know to to address the first part of that, and that is, should the commissioners be involved in in uh, hiring a, a new director? Um, you know, we've we've kind of been all over the board on that uh, in our four years. We, sometimes we've been involved with hiring a, a department head, and sometimes we haven't. And uh, I don't know. At the very most. Uh, we should be involved in maybe the the final 
just to, but you know, finding someone and interviewing and all that process should fall on um, HR and and you're the boss, you know, of the county. That's that's the way I see it. And others might not see it that way. Uh, maybe we could sit in on the final two or three finalists or something like that because you know we've we've like I said we've been all over the board on it. We've been involved. We weren't involved much on the engineer. Uh, you know, human ser um, the senior services is a different story, and and someone else we've been involved in it all the way. So I don't, I don't know. I'd like to hear the other commissioners' thoughts on that. But uh, day to day and hiring and firing is up up to your departments, I think. So that's where I feel on that. Do you have a comment, Marilyn? No, I would I would agree. We've done different processes, and and we can certainly pre-screen the candidates and do some pre-interviews and come up with a short list for commissioners if that's what you decide. Anyone else? That that makes sense to me. Um, again, you know, say you get twenty applicants, you know, I'm not so sure that I'm the right person to go through all those. I'd kind of trust you to weed through that, but I I. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do believe that that we probably ought to be part of the last two or three. And you know, that's kind of where I've, you know, or at least in terms of review and make a recommendation, and then you guys can go forward from there. Okay. I mean, I, I've seen this firsthand at the KAC, where a board of 20 is involved in the in the final selection, and and it becomes pretty gooey. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, uh, it, this is a hard time for Rick to be leaving us because the Expo Center is going to start really taking off and, and moving forward where it's been pretty stagnant here w waiting on this, uh, on this contract with the city. Uh, I think there's some merit into when, when looking for someone uh, to uh, oversee the Expo Center that you get the best person for long term that is an expert or can handle that portion of it. But with the other things coming on, the uh, construction and all that, uh, that could muddy the waters if they're directed to, to find someone with, with that type of background but might not be that strong in, in managing an expo center and promoting it. So I see merit into going outside and getting a different entity to to overseeing some of uh, the projects and uh, the construction and, and that and not putting that so much on the, the uh, this person that's going to be hired, even both, though both, he would oversee that. Yeah, both great points. Um, and I agree, Commissioner Weiss. I mean, we if we try to roll one person into that, I think you're narrowing down your ba you know, who, who we could hire, where if we separate that, you may be have a lot of people here and a lot of people there. So I'm in total agreement with you on that. That, that brings to me another question. Why, why are we not uh, going forward immediately with, with some of our renovations? Why, why, are, why are we not starting with that process of getting some bids or, or uh, getting that ball rolling? Well, um, I know Rick has been working on trying to clean up some of the things that um, were required to do by the end of the year in terms of um, moving things out of the old uh, Tri-River Stadium and that sort of thing. I think we are in a position where we need to start um, trying to um, you know, get out bids for things that, that will be coming next year. Um, you know, I, I just, I think that, um, frankly, that the contract got signed and um, everybody sort of breathed a sigh of relief, but this is the time to pick that back up. So point well taken. Okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, quick question here is that here... Uh, you know, we kind of use, like on the building authority, we're using the architect to do the management of the construction around the building here. At the road and bridge out there, at that new building, we use the architect as the manager there. And I'm, I'm going, why here, 
And I just want to ask, is it, why can't we use the architect as that type of person there? Or, or And I other thing, when you mentioned over here at the senior center, I, I mean, I didn't remember us, or did we even uh, hire a project manager over there? That's also an architect. There's okay, that was they. They used the architect as the. Okay, that's uh, I. When you said that, I. Uh, yes. So, that, but so I you're absolutely correct. I mean, it very well could be an architect. Um, we don't really have an architect under contract currently for the Expo Center project. We had an architect that we worked with mm -hmm. in the past regarding the design Concept. of um, potential improvements in the. Um, the uh, horse, what am I trying to say? The uh, arena. Warm up, warm warm up arena. arena. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yep. Brain in. Yeah, senior moment there. But um, so we did have somebody that we worked with. It could be that person or it could be someone else um, but we just we just don't have anybody on under contract at the current time but if the commission is amenable to that I mean we will move forward with getting someone and I think that would be the first step towards um, you know as chair Vidrickson said getting this under underway okay. well you know right now and that's why I might go back to my question why aren't we doing it now we have the guy in place and that's Rick Lamer we still have he's still going to be working here for another seven months the more we can get done in that seven months time with his expertise and his management the less we are going to need an architect who is going to be expensive and uh, and to me, with the type of projects that we've got going on, and I don't see how we need an architect to tell us that we need to replace windows. We already know what we need to replace. We already know what building needs to come down. Uh, you know, when we get those that high price <coughs> project manager, I mean, that costs a lot of money. And in my opinion, that's not the not the way to go. And that's why I want Rick. Uh, and, and his staff right now to get on this and get moving. They don't have a lot of projects or a lot of uh, shows going over and on over there right now. Get these get these things out for bid and let's get it started. And I think Rick Rick is highly capable of handling that. Who we hand who we hire next, as Monty and and other commissioners have absolutely pointed out, that person may not have expertise in running an expo center and being a project manager at the same time. Rick Lemer has that expertise, in my opinion. And I think we need to light that fire and get it moving. And seven months down the road, there can be the project, while the project may not be completed, uh, we could sure have it in place to when to get started and, and who's going to do it. And Rick's the guy. And that would save us. I mean, I don't see how an architect would take it on without a minimum of a ten or $20,000 fee right off the top. So... That's, that's my opinion. Okay, commissioners, we'll go ahead and, and try to fine tune the job description for this position so we can start looking at what, what the commissioners want for that particular department and, and update that job description and, and bring that before you and make sure it's the same vision that you have. Okay. I guess I just have one other question while we're talking about this. So, and Marilyn, you have more of this history than I do, obviously, but the um, noxious weed, I just want to confirm that we want this to continue to be a combined position because I understand that in the past, these were two separate things and then it... It's, it's two separate positions right now. It used to be a combined okay. position. the other way. Yeah, we had a, a livestock and expo center that was also the weed supervisor. And when Rick took over as the livestock and expo, we separated that out and we have another individual that is the weed supervisor. And to add to that, that supervisor of the noxious weeds is not doing noxious weed spraying and so on and so forth throughout the year. So then he becomes uh, an additional employee for the Expo Center, an additional someone who can can uh, jump in and help, you know, if you see what I'm saying. I mean, David Flaherty is the Noxious Weed Director, and a good part of the time uh, that he, throughout the year, he's not doing a doggone thing with Noxious Weeds. He's at the Expo Center working. They're, they're, I think if you took a toll or a, a poll of, of uh, 
noxious weeds directors, uh, you'd find out that a good part of their daily chores is nap, taking a nap yeah. throughout the year in the winter time. Uh, not that ours does that because yeah. he doesn't. He's over at the Expo Center filling in and working and, and you know, serving a second position. So I just wanted to confirm that the, that part, that way we have it divided right now is working well, uh, for the commission and quite frankly I don't know if we're the ones to ask that I mean Rick Lamer knows all about it and I think you know that's that's another part of his expertise that uh, and and David also you know that uh, that there's a time during the season that uh, noxious weed director is got to be all over noxious weeds and there's a time that he needs to be helping at the Expo Center or can help so my question is, uh, and it's uh, similar to what we did with our uh, with our planning. Uh, I would I would want advice from from the administrator and HR whether whether we need that separation, whether the job could be combined back if if it's if you're only spending part of your time um, in the operations of noxious weed, maybe we can maybe the uh, Expo uh, director can wear that hat also. I, I, I would, I would like some some history and some input from the two of you, if if that could be done. I agree. I would I would think we could have a conversation with Rick with his history in the department. He has seen it both ways to see which is the most efficient. And to take your thought further, Commissioner, I mean, can can we look? Like we did with the planning director w with neighboring counties. Right. I mean, is there yeah. is there some job sharing that you can do? But just just to look at it. I don't know if that's yes. the answer. And that is a, that is a good good thought to look at that. But and I just want to go back a little bit because I remember years ago where the weed department used to be out at the Rudin Bridge. And and one of the things <laughs> the weed and feed or the weed and feed <laughs> the weed department, you know. Uh, a lot of times that that weed department needs to be out spraying also is that in the winter when we're doing a lot of tree mulching and stuff i mean the way that i've been told is that that's when those trees should be being sprayed and but we don't have a truck that can be inside to keep it thawed out to where it can go do this stuff so i mean we're, we're sitting here and we're talking about some of the other things but i i think it could be a lot busier at certain times of the year than it is. Well, as far as co-oping with a, with a, with another county or entity, uh, I think the only issue there might be w when this re weed department is busy, that weed department is busy too. It's kind right. of a seasonal yep. thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't I don't know. It's like combining their co-oping emergency management when when. Dickinson County has an emergency. Saline County's probably got one too, and it just doesn't work that way. So, I I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I would but sure sure want to respect any input you folks could give back to to the, I, the need. I think all of those comments and all of those questions are pertinent, uh, but I without a stamp of approval or recommendation from Rick Lamer is and and David Flaherty, that's that's where this conversation needs to go. Next step. All right. Okay. Well, I appreciate the feedback from the commissioners. We just wanted to know where to go with this. So, thank you. All righty. Okay. Go Can ahead. I ask one more thing. Uh, we have a, a fair board meeting tonight, and I know it's come up again about. And I know this this commission has talked about uh, the displacing or the moving of the. Uh, bleachers and the panels and I was wanting to know is there any more thought about that is that about uh, giving that or to the fair if they want it I, I thought we were done with that I thought we had well we haven't done made the final decision but that has been our feeling all along was to donate that material to the uh, uh, to the tri rivers fair and rodeo was to yeah, I believe in conversation with Rick, I believe he intends to bring an item to the, an RFA for, you know, d disposal of those items um, once he hears from the fair board a f sort of a firm yes that they want to take a possession of them. 
Uh, and that's the, that's the, the, the and that's the reason why I wanted to say ask that again because the fair board. And, and speaking with them again is that they're kind of waiting for the commissioners to say, okay, yes, we are giving it to you or donating it to you. Well, so, I think you can safely go to the, uh, fair, the fair board, board and tell them that the county and commission uh, will will probably donate that stuff to them if they so wish, but they need to, to we need to know what their intentions are too. I, I think this is the two-way street. Of whether they were going to enter in a contract with the city, as far as and that's in the that's stadium. in the works. Yeah, but but that still needs to come in an RFA. You just can't yeah, verbally right. don't exactly. You can't verbally don't do anything. Yeah. Okay. So it is okay to go ahead and voice tonight at the meeting that 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 could be donated to them. If, if they're looking for it, uh, they, but it needs to come through, uh, through the proper channels and through yeah, okay. the proper process to, right. uh, if they make a request for that material and Rick brings it to us, uh, I'm guessing that we're going to give it to them. Okay. I All think right. that's a good, good okay. decision. Thank you. All right. Is there any other business? If not, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. We adjourn today's meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We're Thank adjourned. You. Thank you.